Hi, everyone. Welcome to Avanti Insights. Adrian Vernon here along with, as usual, Chris Gettle. Chris, this is episode 16. Can you believe it? The beat just goes on. Yeah, it's crazy. We've, you know, we've been doing this for a while now. Our followers are increasing. We appreciate you guys all joining us here for yet another episode. Um, I think we've got a good lineup of conversation here today as well. We do. Chris, today I'm going to call this our headline news episode. We're quickly going to hit upon uh, multiple happenings in cybersecurity news. So I say let's get into it. Headline number one, Apple made news recently, obviously, with the launch of iOS 15. But did you hear about the critical security flaw that was fixed in iOS 14.8 that came out only a week before that iOS 15 launch. Can you shed some light on what happened there? Yeah, so this was a vulnerability that came to light because of some nation state activity that started to take advantage of this. So it actually affects more than just the iOS. It's basically all your Apple devices, your Mac OS and the iOS devices. So your iPads, your even the Apple Watch is uh, exposed to this. What this is, is a zero click vulnerability. So it used to be called like a server side vulnerability, but basically this allows an attacker to get onto a device without much interaction at all. Once on the device, these guys were able to, they can get access to your microphone, to your camera, to all data access, anything on there, even install additional applications on that device. Now, the group that created this was a, a corporation that was creating tools to be used by nations to spy on individuals. The software was called Pegasus. And uh, what it allowed them to do was put this on high profile individuals devices so that they could try to basically spy on or infiltrate into that person's life and gather information or intel on there. It was so it was found on uh, a few high level or high profile uh, person's phones. And also journalists were being targeted with this as well by certain nation states. Now, the chances of Pegasus being on most of our devices is pretty slim. You know, this is this is some nation state level technology used to target very high profile individuals. Most of us don't fall under that category. The part that is concerning about this is now that this has been exposed, what, you know, what happens next is this opening in the Apple uh, software allows other threat actors to now take advantage of it. So typically when uh, nation states are at play, the tools that they're using slowly start to get exposed more and more out to the market. You know, we had some very notable NSA tools get exposed to the market, which led to WannaCry, NotPetya, and other eternal blue family of vulnerabilities being used in a lot of different attacks. That's another example of when nation states play. At some point, the rest of the cyber criminal world will get their hands on this technology. So what happens next? Well, organizations needed to start to make sure that people's devices were being updated. The Mac OS updates, a lot of companies have patch management technologies. Avanti can support the Mac platform. Many of you might even be using our patching technology for the Mac platform. But with the iOS devices, it becomes a little bit more nebulous. It's harder to be able to force things to happen on a mobile device because that user has more control over it. There's a shift happening in the manufacturers to try to enable more direct management of those things. But there's this back and forth over privacy and corporate level access happening in the mobile devices of the world that we're still in the middle of. So if you're in the, the small number of organizations that have more control over those devices, you might have been able to do a push notification to your users saying, update your, your iOS version by you know taking these steps. You may have been able to take another step and say, if they haven't done it by a certain amount of time, cut off access to corporate email or corporate applications and uh, data. Most organizations don't have that type of capability. This is where you know the strength of our mobile iron technology having the MDM capabilities and our secure productivity apps and mobile threat defense all in one combined solution really does give uh, organizations with that level of capability an advantage because they can start to take those actions. But most organizations are actually you know being forced to reduce security on mobile devices. I'll, I'll throw a couple of stats here at you uh, real quick, Adrian. Those of you who follow Verizon, Verizon has a couple of very interesting yearly reports they put out. 
most notably the data breach investigations report. I've been following that one for years. They've also got a mobile security index report. Ivanti actually participated in contributing to that this year. We did, gave them some great statistics on emergence of QR codes and how those could be used to attack our users on mobile devices. But a couple of other stats that were very interesting coming out of this, 76% of IT pros said that they had been pressured to sacrifice security of mobile devices for expediency to meet business goals. Um, now, of those, you know, of, of the people that were surveyed in, in, from that particular vendor who contributed, 45% of companies said that they actually had to take action and reduce their security capabilities. So right now, we're in this tug of war over control over that, that mobile device. All of our users are using their mobile to access email, to access corporate data. It's all, it, when a vulnerability like this comes out, that corporate data is now exposed. And again, Pegasus may have been nation state level tools that were targeting a very small percentage of people in the world. But now that these tools are becoming more and more visible to the broader market, anybody can start to use those to you know, buy off the shelf access to weaponized versions of these same exploits and be able to take advantage of that. So pressure is on. We need to make sure that our mobile devices are becoming more and more secure. But let me ask you this, Chris. So uh, given with you know, the, the increase that we see in you know, cybersecurity threats and it's, it's increasing by the day, uh, we know that. The headlines continue to, you know, to take center stage in a lot of cases. Do you anticipate that that pressure could shift a little bit? That say, hey, you know what? We re the business side says we really do need to focus on security. Make sure you don't skip on security when rolling this out this next thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there is there is uh, a lot of pressure and uh, a lot of uh, concern around that mobile device. The number one type of attack on the mobile device is trying to compromise a user's credentials. Phishing is a, a top attack vector. But we're seeing vulnerabilities like this recent Apple one, which allow access to get you know, more complete access on that phone and be able to use it to spy on, you know, whoever those individuals are. So with that, you know, there you're seeing more and more companies, you know, banning, you know, cell phones from important meetings. But, you know, there there's there's a tipping point that we haven't quite reached yet. We're we're getting closer to it though. This back and forth over the user's privacy versus security of that device and access to corporate uh, information. The regulatory uh, requirements, you know, if you look at, we talked about the Biden administration, the zero trust guidance that had just recently come out. In that guidance is very clearly stated that mobile devices need to be secured as well as client devices. So it absolutely is a rising concern and there's going to be more and more pressure, especially in the highly regulated spaces to ensure that we've got security across all of our devices and security for users, security for access, and most importantly, for the data that those all come into contact with. So it's definitely, it's it's a mounting challenge that's uh, pressures increasing. Okay, Chris, let's move to uh, headline number two. It's being reported that researchers have discovered threat actors exploiting a disclosed critical security flaw to use compromised systems as crypto miners. Now we're hearing that it's a remote execution flaw that was used. What is that? And what else do we know about this attack? Yeah, so remote code execution is uh, basically, it's, it's the, one of the more scary forms of, of vulnerabilities. It allows an attacker to exploit a system without needing to have local access to it. They also don't need to interact with a user to execute that attack. So they don't have to fish a user. They don't have to try to have somebody help them get the malware onto that system they're able to just go and uh, target that system remotely and deliver the the payload that they want to in this case you know cryptocurrency you know crypto miners are quite insidious when it comes to this a lot of uh, e-commerce web servers you know and other tools in this case the the software targeted in this case the uh, confluence platform is a uh, wiki software that's used by a lot of organizations WordPress is another prime example of, you know, very common web facing, very public facing uh, software that all of us are running. So th these types of remote code execution flaws, if they can see a public facing server, inject their crypto miner onto that system and do that times thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of systems globally, 
suddenly they just get to kick back and let this thing continue to mine money for them. And it's all coming at uh, the expense of CPU, power consumption, uh, even cloud costs of the organization that didn't update that software. Okay, let's move on to headline number three. We all heard about the SolarWinds breach at the end of last year in December 2020. A major cyber attack suspected to have been committed by a group backed by the Russian government, and it penetrated thousands of organizations globally, including multiple parts of the U.S. federal government, leading to a series of data breaches. And this included the Department of Homeland Security, Chris, and the U.S. Treasury Department. You remember we talked about this, our very first episode of Anti Insights, released in December 2020, right as this was you know, major front page news. That was episode one, numero uno, all the way back in December. You remember? And if anyone is interested in going back, take a, take a more detailed listen, you go back to episode one back in December. Now, Chris, there's reports coming out that we haven't seen the last of the group that was suspected above in this SolarWinds breach. Give us a quick rundown on the latest SolarWinds related news as it sits today. Yeah, so one thing that often happens is after a major incident gets uncovered, a group that executed that may come under uh, a lot of scrutiny. They may have to even disband or go, uh, you know, sublevel for a little while to regroup and let let things die down a little bit. And that seems to be what happened here is this group, uh, a new uh, backdoor uh, technology called Tamiris is being seen out there. It's uh, got the same capabilities that the Sun Shuttle second stage malware used to, in the SolarWinds breach. But basically, it looks like this technology has now resurfaced in a group that may very well be the same group or elements of the same group that was used before. So, you know, not related to the SolarWinds breach, but the skill set of that group, the technology that they were using uh, looks to still be out there. And, uh, you know, what what are they doing today? This is this is the type of thing that um, as we see major incidents like this happen, this is why we have to investigate, research and understand how they went about these so we can figure out how to combat the tactics they're using because they will surface again at some point. So this one, no specific event, uh, large scale event like solar winds has happened at this point, but are they out there looking for and building up to another kind of large scale supply chain event? Very possible. The, the thing to be diligent about here is to focus in on uh, the same things we talked about in that episode one, making sure that if you're a, if you are a service provider, if you are developing a technology or a platform for customers to consume, you want to be extra diligent about your CI CD pipeline. You want to make sure that you're looking at and ensuring that your code is secure, that the components you integrate with are secure and uh, keeping up to date and uh, that you've also got good cybersecurity hygiene practices within those development environments. So more of just a, a call to action here. This is a, a group that's resurfacing that specializes in that type of uh, advanced persistent threat tactic of getting into and infiltrating supply chains like that. Just a, another call to be diligent in your security practices. And Chris, we've talked about this before, you know, where for many organizations, even when you have security solutions in place right now with the way things are going, it's not a matter of if you're going to get hit. It's a matter of when. So we can't stop these threat actors completely. But how do we disrupt these threat actors? How do we throw them off their game? Yeah, it, it absolutely more of a, a when kind of situation. They constantly change their tactics. You know, when one model isn't working, they'll shift to another. And if we find a way to disrupt that, you know, we can we can stop them, we can disrupt them, we can make it more difficult for them to execute that and force them to go on to other things. Can we ever eliminate cybercrime? Well, that's like, uh, you know, trying to say, can we ever, you know, completely eliminate the drug trade or, you know, just regular street crime? No, you can never fully eliminate that. What we can do is we can learn from it and we can make ourselves more resilient to the types of things that they're doing. So this is where, you know, the, the Biden administration executive order urging companies to do a more strong zero trust strategy absolutely plays to, you know, this type of uh, strategy. It's built around access to our data. It's built around the shifts that we've had, the trends globally that we've had, where more and more people are working remotely from any device. 
And we need to think about how we're securing very differently. So can we, can we take the amount of increase of, you know, ransomware crime? Can we reduce that? Yes, absolutely. I think we, the, the world at whole, you know, can combat this to a point where we can start to reduce that effect. Is it going to be difficult? Yes. But, you know, how do we go about that? It's absolutely a matter of focusing in on frameworks like Zero Trust, frameworks like uh, the CIS uh, controls or the NIST cybersecurity framework. Utilizing the guidance from those types of frameworks, we can start to you know, create roadmaps, security roadmaps within any organization to build up and improve our security measures. So can we eliminate ransomware altogether? No, but can we make it so that we're less likely to be a target? Absolutely. Can we make it so that if we are hit by ransomware, we can reduce the amount of downtime, increase our ability to recover, and eliminate the or you know reduce the number of uh, situations where a payout to that threat actor is necessary to recover? That's what we need to be doing to to better or to improve our security overall. And you know al along those lines of you know how do we affect because it, it's not a question of if it's a question of when you know this hit may occur you know how do we effectively remediate the situation you know as as quickly as we can you know minimize the damage you know, we did an episode if you remember not too long ago it was just a few weeks ago it was in early August the next evolution of patch management don't try to patch everything how do you prioritize and we brought uh, Shri on who was the former C CEO of Risk Sense a company that we recently acquired here at Avanti, and it'd be worth people perhaps going out and checking that out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on that note, you know, that risk-based approach, you know, we're, we're looking at tapping into that for the broader experience that we're all trying to deal with. Can we get that risk-based approach of what we need to resolve on mobile devices? Can we get it on traditional clients and servers? Can we get it for cloud-based solutions, on-prem-based solutions? We need that type of visibility everywhere. There's, there's no way to tackle all of the, the security issues that are out there. What we need to focus on first is the ones that threat actors are taking advantage of and have tools to be able to, to execute on. And that information does exist. It's something that RiskSense specializes in. And the, one of the key reasons we acquired them strategically at Avanti here is to bring that visibility to our customers, make sure that they've got a feel for what's putting their organization at risk so they can attend to those, those urgent needs first. If we de-risk our situation, we could, could we avoid being the target? Possibly not. Can we mitigate the, the overall impact? Absolutely. Okay. You know, I was going to ask you, I was going to say, Hey, we're, we're quickly winding down. Do you have a final parting thought? That sounded like that might've been it, or is there anything else to add? No, I, I stole your thunder on that one. Your, your closing <laughs> question there. I think my, that was my parting thought for this week. <laughs> All right, Chris. Hey, as always, love getting together with you every couple of weeks. So uh, you know what? It's October. Let's not forget Cybersecurity Awareness Month here in the month of October. So uh, anything to add about that? Uh, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one of my favorite personal security uh, tips. This one actually, uh, you know, a former colleague of mine uh, shared this tip with me a few years back. But I report um, my credit card as damaged at least once a year to get it changed out. And the reason for that is, you know, you, you go and use your credit card everywhere and you never know when that card was captured in a credit card breach or a card skimmer or something else somewhere, anywhere. So especially if you're similar to like myself or if you're a road warrior out there traveling a lot, make sure to uh, change your card out more frequently. You know, it's it's uh, not too difficult to do when you report a card damage. Typically, they're going to give you a card with an updated C uh, CVV and different expiration date on it. The number will stay the same, but enough information changed where if anything was captured, it's not going to make it very easy for them to try to guess at those other two elements to, to use that credit card. I actually just got back from vacation not too long ago, but we were road tripping and on our way home, the day we're like leaving to drive, like, you know, two days worth of driving back to back home, we got a, my card got declined and it's because there was a fraudulent charge being made. So I called the credit card company. We figured out what was going on. We ended up actually having to temporarily accept that fraudulent claim just so I could have a credit card enough to, to, you know, spend uh, money as needed on the way home because we had gas and meals and other stuff to pick up yet. But it was 
just under my one year window. Uh, I was actually looking forward to getting my card updated uh, sometimes shortly after that. But even that one year window sometimes isn't quite enough. Okay. And, and when you talk about this one year window, do you coincide that with cybersecurity awareness month? Like, does that say, oh, every October, I better do this? <laughs> yep, actually. And uh, the reason the reason I brought it up and remembered that is uh, several years back, we did a cybersecurity tips for road warriors kind of uh, blog post. We had like 10 recommendations from some of our most uh, you know global travelers, things like you can get little uh, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots when you travel to a hotel, you hook that up to their Wi-Fi and you connect through it and establish a VPN tunnel that completely separates you from the hotel Wi-Fi. Other things, tips like that, we shared that month. This was one of the tips that was shared in that in that case. So now I tend to do this around October every year. So Well, I'll tell you, Chris, I like that. And so as we move into mid-October in our next episode, and with it being smack in the middle of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, I think that's a great place. Perhaps I, you know, our producer, Craig, he's listening in right now, and I, I can see his wheels turning in his brain thinking, maybe that could just be Chris and Daniel, you know, Security Tips Month, Personal Security Tips Month in and around that. So I think we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more. That'd be a fun episode. All right, Chris, always, always a pleasure. We'll talk again in a couple of weeks. Folks, thanks for listening. Until next time, stay safe, be secure, and keep smiling.